are now going to start talking about a time where people were kind of able to get away from the dangers of life and really um, not focus so much on surviving, but more on looking at improving themselves and looking at improving their countries and making their countries bigger and better. This new era was known as the Renaissance. The Renaissance, uh, which also uh, is can be translated into the word rebirth, um, was really a time of new interest in, in art and learning and science and all of these different things um, that allow us to be a better, more productive, more modern society. <clears throat> and so um, what was happening at this time that allowed it to start, what made it start was a farming surplus. And the farming surplus came about because there was more technology and better technology. Um, things like the horse collar and all these things were being invented that allowed farmers to farm more and farm faster and to create more food with the amount of farmland that they had already. And so when you have more food, when you have extra food, instead of not enough food to survive, you can start to focus on other things, on non-survival things, on the sciences and the arts and all of these things <clears throat> that make society better but aren't really about just staying alive. The other thing that happened and made the Renaissance start was uh, an increase in trade. So um, during this time, people started to go out to other countries and trade different items and and trade their goods for the goods from faraway countries that they never had any access to in their own countries. And when you go out to these faraway countries, you bring your own ideas and the ideas of your country and you spread them out along the world. But the other thing you do is you talk to people and you get their ideas from all around the world and you get to bring them back to your country, therefore making your country smarter and your country can work on and adapt those ideas to make them even better. And so um, as far as, you know, the spreading of ideas goes, trade is very, very, very important because people are out actually moving around the world more than they ever were before. Uh, the center of the Renaissance was Italy. Um, and Italy was the center of the Renaissance because it was um, kind of the center of trade at this time. Um, if you look at Italy, right below it is the Mediterranean Sea, and that's connected to Africa, Asia, and of course Europe. And so all three of those continents were accessible by that one sea, and so it was very easy for the um, Italians to trade from that being their home base. And more specifically than just saying that these cities and these centers of trade were in Italy, they were some of the biggest ones were the northern Italy cities, uh, the cities of Venice, which is right here, and of Genoa, which is over here, and of Florence, which is right here. And so really North Italy was kind of the center of this new learning uh, movement. And the reason was because, of course, it was the center of trade. And so Venice, Genoa and Florence were really the center of trade in the entire world at this time. And um, the way that they would trade is they would go around and they would look for, you know, things like um, silks and spices and all these kinds of things that you could get from Asia, and they would trade coins. But the thing was, in these markets, people were trading coins from all different kinds of countries, and so it was really hard to tell um, how much each coin was worth. And so um, you had to be really knowledgeable to be able to sell anything. Uh, so a new invention came in to kind of help that problem. And this new invention was banking. Okay, And banking was the idea that you could come in and deposit your coins from your country into a bank. And these people would be experts on the money and how much each coin is worth um, when you compare it to all the other coins. And then you would deposit it and the bank would keep that money. And then they would <clears throat> have a check system where you could just write a check for whatever value um, the other the seller wanted. And then that seller could come and get the correct kind of coins that they wanted from the bank. And this was happening all across northern Italy. But of course, northern Italy wasn't this super great democracy at this time. No, um, it was not even a country Italy. It was a set of small city states, just like we found in Greek and Greece. 
Um, and they were ruled mostly by these powerful families. Like one powerful family would rule an entire city. And then there was some power in the merchant class as well. Um, and they were always fighting with each other. And so they also developed something else, um, that we know about income and property taxes to try and help to pay for the wars that they were fighting with each other. And of course, with this trade creating contact, it created contact with all kinds of different countries and all kinds of different people. Um, and um, one of the main areas that it created contact with was Asia and the Muslim world. And some really interesting ideas came from that that would help um, Europe to grow and blossom and become uh, as powerful as they did later on become. And so um, a couple of these are uh, Muslim scholars, and one of them just individually is this guy up top, and that his name is Al-Khwarizmi. And Al-Khwarizmi, he created algebra in the 700s. He used the uh, Arabic numerals and started to work with the concept of algebra, putting in, you know, not necessarily numbers, but placeholders and, and variables in those places. Okay. Um, and the other thing that happened, this wasn't al Khwarizmi, but this is just Muslim scholars in general. They started to copy down and get copies and, and, uh, you know, share those copies of all the works that had been created from Greece and Rome from those ancient societies and share those around to Northern Europe where um, those ideas had not spread on their own. And so um, the ideas started to shift and the focus started to shift and the focus used to be on heaven and it used to be on God and religion and doing everything that you can to serve God. Uh, and it changed at this point and it really hasn't ever gone back. Um, it changed to an idea of humanism. Okay, so the focus has mainly been, yes, people are still religious, but the focus has mainly been on non-religious subjects, things like history and philosophy and science and all of these things. Humanism, basically it, what it, it does is instead of emphasizing you um, going out and serving your God, it's more important for you to serve the people um, on this world and not necessarily your religion or your God. And so um, a lot of people would say those two things are not separate. You can still serve your God by serving the people of this world. So that's kind of humanism is a backing away from religious subjects and uh, focusing more on these subjects that are of this world. Um, the art also started to change. It, it changed from kind of really fancy flowery things into more lifelike things, looking again more at the world, more humanist art. Um, and so <clears throat> these statues and paintings started to imitate life a little more. And we can see a couple of the works by uh, Michelangelo here. We can see the roof of the Sistine Chapel right here where he um, drew very realistic um, depictions of Bible scenes. And again, this isn't the focus on the religious. This is because it's in a church. Um, and then also one of the most famous statues of time that Michael Edgelow made, um, which is the statue of David. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, also very famous. Hopefully you already know a little bit about him. He was uh, an interesting inventor, but he also painted um, one of the most famous paintings of all time, the Mona Lisa. So again, trade was really starting to grow at this time. And the reason that trade was starting to grow was because of uh, there were just better roads set up and better sea routes set up where the boats were starting to um, be a little bit faster and really speed up the sea travel. Um, and during this time in that northern part of Europe, you saw... Um, really a bunch of different like trade associations being born okay where these a bunch of different cities which are these city states these small like country type of type of things were working together with other cities to try and strengthen their trade and so um, for example in Germany there was a, a 
trade association by the name of the Hanseatic League, and it included 60 different towns in Germany. And so while these are small countries, it's essentially a trade um, agreement between 60 different countries. Okay, And this allowed them to start to work together and decide what should we do to be most efficient and get the most products to each other. And they decided that specializing was the best thing to do, as we've talked about before. Specializing is when um, you really focus in on creating one product and you become really good at it, you become an expert at it, and then you can trade all of your extra product for the other products that you need. And so um, specialization was happening all over the place. Um, in England and France, they were specializing in mostly making cloth in um, the northeastern part of uh, Europe, they were focusing on grain like, um, you know, oats and wheat and corn and all of these things. And then in Germany, Austria, and Hungary, which is kind of that Central Europe area, uh, there were many metals like iron and gold and silver and many other metals. So as these goods are spreading, spreading also the ideas that kind of started in that Northern Italy um, area started to spread out into the rest of Europe. And so the traders would go around and they would talk to each other and spread their ideas and get ideas from those people and bring them back to their kingdoms. And then the knowledge started to grow even more because there was such a heavy interest in getting their people educated that many kings that had a lot of money would invite scholars and artists to come in and stay in the uh, stay with them for a while and try and teach their people uh, the different art and um, education items that they were trying to teach. And so because of this, the rich went all the way down to Italy where this is it all began and sought out these scholars and sought out these artists and started to learn um, and become better at these humanistic endeavors. So now we can talk about some of these really smart scholars that were down in that area. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is this gentleman up top. His name is Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, Johannes Gutenberg created the printing press, which is a really big deal because before the printing press was created, the only way to create a book was to copy it down from one uh, book into another by hand. You had to write out a whole book before you could possibly have a copy of it. And what Johannes Gutenberg did is he set up a machine where um, he had letters. Basically, think of it as little metal letters. And he would put them all into order to be a page. And then um, you essentially dip it in ink and press it down on the paper. And you were able to mass produce many, 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 many pages. So while it may take longer to put all those letters in, uh, you know that one those metal letters and that one metal page to create the one page you can make thousands millions however many books that you wanted to however many pages that you wanted to basically instantly once you had that page set up and so it made it way easier to copy books and it made those books way cheaper and so more different people were able to learn to read and study these things okay another famous man that we know from England was uh, William Shakespeare. William uh, Shakespeare was a playwright, which means that he created plays. As you know, you probably have heard of things like Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet and things like that. He made comedies, he made dramas, he made all kinds of different stuff. He was one of the greatest you know, playwrights of all time. Um, and what's important about him at this time is he was also focusing not on the godly realm, not outside of earth, but in earth on the humanistic realm. Okay, so the Protestant Reformation came next, and this has a lot to do with um, Christianity and kind of how uh, almost a whole half of Christianity was formed. At this time, really, the only group um, in the area, at least, was or of Christians was Catholics, okay? And the Catholic Church was starting to be criticized, um, and so people are starting to read more books and, and work more on humanism and all that kind of stuff, and they're starting to look more closely closely at the church 
and not just allow them to be or to get away with whatever, whatever they want. And so the, what they started to realize as they're looking at the Catholic Church is that it was becoming way too rich, okay? And it wasn't spending its money on the things that it should be. Instead, it was just giving its leaders the money. And it was becoming way too powerful where um, the church could be involved in politics and telling kings what to do and, um, you know, just kind of running the entire show. Um, and at this time, one example of its abuse of power was the Inquisition, where it would go around and it would find people and accuse them of being non-Christians, um, and they would torture those people until they admitted to being uh, bad people or non-Christians, essentially, and then they would oftentimes steal their property and steal their land and stuff like that, um, sometimes even executing and killing them. And so what had happened is the leaders had become very corrupt in the Catholic Church. And so a lot of Christians that didn't want this happening uh, started to think about um, how can you really fight uh, the Catholic Church. And it was really a scary proposition as they're executing and torturing people. So you know they have the power and the ability to do that kind of stuff. Um, but kind of the last straw and the really the biggest problem that they saw is that people or the Catholic Church was selling indulgences at this time. They don't still do this, but selling indulgences was basically if you sinned, if you did something bad that God did not like that you were not supposed to do, then what you would do is you would go into the church and you could buy a piece of paper that said you were forgiven for your sins. And so basically, if you did bad things as a rich people you, or a rich person, you could do unlimited bad things. You could do anything you wanted. You just go in and give money to, to the church to make up for it, whereas poor people really had no avenue of getting their sins forgiven. And that's not the idea of... Christianity. The idea of Christianity is everyone should be forgiven. And so um, Martin Luther, this man right here, and of course he's not related in any way to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., his uh, father was a, a Protestant um, a Protestant uh, priest, and so, you know, he was probably named after Martin Luther, uh, but otherwise they're not related at all. Martin Luther's a German monk who ended up calling for the reform of the church, and what he did is he wrote out 95 problems, the 95 theses it's called, um, and he went and nailed it on the door of the Catholic Church, and basically... He's, uh, he decided that we're not going to deal with this anymore, we're going to break apart, we're going to make our own churches, and we're going to protest against the Catholic Church. And so when they decided to protest against the Catholic Church, they started to call them Protestant churches, because the root word of that is to protest. And so um, they created these Protestant churches where instead of you going into church and expecting all of the information about God and everything from the priest, from the person standing up front and whatever they say is right, that um, really the truth of the religion is in the Bible and not in the church. And so if you have a Bible and you can uh, do all that kind of stuff, uh, read it and um, study it and all that kind of stuff, you're just as good as the person who's able to go to church consistently. So many of these Protestant churches um, were created in a lot of different ways, but people started to kind of study the Bible and decide what did it mean to them. And so um, John Calvin started a group called the Calvinists, and he explained out his beliefs and he said, basically, God is completely in charge of absolutely everything that happens in the universe. And all you have to do is be a good person, be moral, and work hard. And if you're moral and you work hard and you actually do these things, then you will be rewarded by God because God's in charge of everything. And so basically, um, in the Calvinist movement, if you were... If you had money and you were rich and you had power and you had good things in your life, it was because you had been a good person and God had rewarded you with that. Um, so basically, um, you were seen as more of a good person if you had more power and more money and all that kind of stuff. Um, also, at this time, the governments were um, persecuting other religions. 
Um, and you know, you saw this happening all over the place and people were running away to America because their religion was being uh, taken down or maybe you'd be tortured or maybe you'd be made fun of, or maybe you'd be taxed higher. Or there were, uh, there was basically penalties for being certain religions other than the main religion of the country. And so, um, people didn't like that. People ran away from that and came to America. And so in order to avoid uh, misuse of power, of the government power, the United States decided this is not good, and in our Constitution, we're going to make sure there's a separation of church and state, that those two things are not connected, but instead um, they're completely separate, uh, that there is no official religion, and we allow anybody to have any religion that they want. Um, another guy, in kind of an interesting story, King Henry VIII, he was uh, the king of England, and he really wanted a son. He wanted an heir so that his son could be the next king. Um, and so he was married, and they just kept trying to have kids and trying to have kids and trying to have kids. And, you know, they just were not having a lot of success. Only one daughter that they had, which he wanted a son, um, but only one daughter had survived past being an infant. And so what he wanted, he was mad at his wife, and he basically said, um, you know what, she can't have a baby. It's her fault. I need to go on. I need to find a new wife and have you know, a boy, at least one boy, uh, and probably even more kids is what he really wanted. And so he wanted a divorce, and he went to the Pope uh, to ask for a divorce because it was a Catholic country. And, and of course, the leader of the Catholics, the Pope, said, well, we don't do divorces in Catholicism. It's not something you're supposed to do, and this is not a reason to get divorced, so no, you cannot do it. And so King Henry VIII said, fine, I'm going to create my own church, a Protestant church. It's going to be called the Anglican Church, or the Church of England. And in this church, we're going to allow divorces and I'm going to be allowed to divorce my wife. And so he created an entire another church so that he could um, divorce his wife. He went on, though, interestingly enough, it wasn't actually his wife's fault because he went on to have five more wives and only to have one daughter and one son. And so um, I think the, probably the real problem medically was Henry VIII. All right, now we're going to kind of focus out of the uh, the Renaissance and the spread of ideas and all that kind of stuff and more to the spread of people and why people started to move around and be better at moving around. Uh, the first thing we need to look at is a simple definition, um, cartography. Cartography is the science of making maps and globes, so being able to make very accurate maps and globes of the world. Um, and so this became very, very popular, and people had all these different ideas, and they were going out to explore these these ideas. One of the main countries that was doing this was Portugal. Okay, And Portugal started it because of this man up on the top here, Henry the Navigator. Okay, um, He was a prince of Portugal, and he had the idea of creating something called a caravel. And a caravel is a ship with a triangular uh, sail on it. And when you have a triangle sail instead of a big square sail, you can um, use the wind and move in basically any direction because if you tilt it in the right angle you can even run yourself right into the wind uh, because you can catch it kind of on a circular course but um Regardless of that, he also paid for many of these voyages, and he paid for the voyages of Bartolomeu Diaz. He's the second guy down here, and he was the first one to get from Portugal all, all the way around to the southern part of Africa and find his way around Africa. And then Vasco da Gama, went. this guy on the bottom, went one step further. He went around Africa and got all the way to India and was able to trade with those people. And since now... Basically, any country could get out on the ocean, and you didn't have to go through the Mediterranean Sea to get to Asia. Um, you can get to Asia in many other different ways. It basically ended Italy's complete control of trade in the world. And now we'll look at the explorers who came over to the Americas. Um, uh, Christopher Columbus was definitely one of them. He, his goal was he thought that the world was round. He was one of the people who thought the world was round. And he thought, you know what, I can go around the world and get all the way over to the Indies in Asia. Um, he basically wanted to get to Asia to trade with them. 
And he said, since it's a circle, I can go the way that nobody else is going, and I'll make it around to there. Um, and he did end up finding the Americas. He thought it was the Indies, and that's why he, we call people the Indians, because that's what he thought they were, and he started to refer to them that way. Um, and he thought he was in Southeast Asia, but he was really in North and South America. And... So while a lot of people celebrate him, he was not a really a very good dude. He owned slaves. He was not, he was you know responsible for a lot of Indians dying and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so he's not a real good dude, and he's not even really that innovative, smart. Because even though he realized the world was round, a lot of people were, realized the world was round at that time. But he thought it was about one third the size of what it really was. And so he was no genius either. Um, then Spain kind of got in the game after they realized that North and South America were over there, and they sent their conquistadors, which were also explorers, but they were not only explorers, but um, they were trying to take over the area that they came in. So they were also conquerors. So conquistadors basically means conquerors. And so Spain came over and conquered most of the area with conquistadors, which we just learned about in the last unit. Um, and we also know that they spent a lot of their time, these European explorers, looking for the Northwest Passage. Any way that they could stay on their boats, not ever get off their boats and move over land and get all the way through North America. Because they did want to go that opposite way and get around to Asia so that they could trade with it. They were not able to find it because the Northwest Passage does not exist. But a lot of the Europeans, in looking for it, realized there were a lot of resources on the land in North and South America, and that it was pretty good land. And so um, they started to set up colonies in North and South America. Uh, with all these different movements, the government started to move towards absolutism, um, which you can almost think of like a dictatorship, okay? It's, it's basically this centralized and unlimited power given to one person or a small group of people. And the kings thought that this was the right thing to do because they literally thought they had been chosen by their god to be the king of the country, okay? Completely and totally chosen by God. And so... Um, one of these people, one of these men was Philip II, and he was in charge of Spain. He completely controlled it, and as a Catholic country, he was angry at the Protestant countries and wanted to take them over, okay? And so what he wanted to do was take England over and force them to come back into being part of the Catholic Church. And so he sent over an armada of ships, many, many, many ships to go over and defeat England, um, and take them out. And so he sent it across the English Channel. And at this time, it was really, really foggy, and it was kind of hard to see, so the English kind of got lucky. And what the English did is they sent in some small ships that were just loaded with fire and explosives and stuff like that, and they exploded them inside of this giant grouping of Spanish ships. And it turned into this disorganization and chaos, and uh, the English were able to come in with their much smaller and less powerful ships, but those ships were so much faster, and they were able to use their speed and take advantage of the disorganization of the Spanish uh, to be able to defeat them um, and uh, take out the Spanish armada. Another absolutist was named King Louis XIV. He was known as the Sun King of France. Um, and the reason he was the Sun King is it, like the sun was the center of the solar system, the universe at that time, um, what they thought to be the universe. Um, <clears throat> he wanted to be the center of the French government and everything is controlled by him. He also wanted the French country to be the greatest country in Europe, the biggest country, the most powerful country, everything like that. And so he built this big fancy palace that's still used for events today and still very, very fancy. Everything gilded with gold and beautiful marble and taken care of wonderfully. And you could see a picture of it up top, an outdoor space with the marble floor and everything. Um, and 
he built this thing, but he also wanted to build the country. And so he went out trying to take as much of Europe as he possibly could. And so under King Louis XIV, France was constantly at war trying to take more and more and more. Um, and then Austria and Prussia were also fighting against each other, trying to control Central Europe, trying to control um, much of the area around Germany and Poland and those countries um, today.